Hello and welcome to our London History Podcast, where we share our love of London, its people, places and history in 20-minute espresso shot episodes served with a dash of personality. I am Hazel Baker, London tour guide and CEO of London Guided Walks, providing private tours, treasure hunts and live London quizzes to Londoners and visitors alike. To accompany this podcast, we also have hundreds of London history-related blog posts for you to enjoy absolutely free. And we've been busy this summer. We have launched The Daily London, providing you with daily inspiration for things to do in London. You can listen on iTunes, Spotify or even add it to your Alexa flash briefings. And also you can check our website londonguidedwalks.co.uk forward slash flash. Big news. Our September sale is now on. You can get 20% off any private tour if you book online with us all the way up until the end of September. The date of the tour doesn't need to be in September, you just need to make the booking in September and use promo code SUMMER2020 to benefit from this amazing deal. Joining me in the studio today is City of London tour guide Ian McDermott. Hello. Hi there. Thanks for joining us today. It's the perfect time in kicking off the second lot of episodes for the podcast. And it's September, which means the Great Fire of London. And you do a Great Fire of London talk, so you're the perfect tour guide to uh, throw a few questions that uh, our followers have uh, thrown to me. And I'm just passing the bat over to you. So I might not be so lenient with my questions this time. Okay, fair enough. All right. So the first question that we have is, how did the Great Fire of London start? Well, we're talking about a bakery, Thomas Farriner's Bakery, which was in Pudding Lane. And on the morning of the 2nd of September, about two o'clock in the morning, uh, 2nd of September, 1666, one of the workers in the bakery uh, smells burning. Now, if you want to get an idea of where this uh, bakery was, it's quite easy because we've got this uh, big helpful guide for us in the form of the monument. So the monument is just north of London Bridge and if you were to lay the monument on its side it is 202 feet tall and it's 202 feet tall because if you were to lay, lay it on its side its end would rest on Thomas Far- the site of Thomas Farriner's bakery. So this worker in the bakery smells burning and obviously something has gone horribly wrong because if you've got if you're running a bakery in a city like London as most cities were largely made of wood uh, it was crucial that you made sure that the ovens were completely extinguished and something had gone wrong there was burning he raises the uh, household they realize that the bakery is on fire and they escape and they escape over the rooftops only uh, Thomas Uh, Farina's maidservant unfortunately is afraid of heights and she never makes it and she becomes the first victim of the great fire. And you're saying that the fire needed to be extinguished because this happened in the middle of the night? Yes um, and it's an obvious uh, fire precaution to take however what is interesting I think about the great fire is that this is the first devastating fire to affect London since 1212. Now when we get on to talk about the causes of the fire, well we might as well say we get on to it, might as well do it now, one of the obvious reasons why the fire is so devastating is because London is made out of wood and that's why we're saying it's so important to take precautions and yet there hadn't been a really really big fire in London since 1212 which suggests that actually they, the methods that London has employed um, to prevent fires and to to deal with fires in general were fairly effective. So there were fires breaking out all the time, but they were the measures that they had in place were effective in making sure that they were localised and small fires. And that obviously didn't happen this time. So that's a big gap, isn't it, from 1212 to 1666? I mean, no big fires in between? Yeah, the, the last really devastating one was um, 1212. So, I mean, it's, it's a, an enormous gap flies in the face of common sense and when we're talking about why the fire spread so rapidly obviously we've got to talk about the uh, the, the structure of London but it's worth bearing in mind when we're doing this that somehow fire wasn't um, a constant problem I mean it was a constant hazard it was always a danger it was always in the background but uh, Londoners had dealt with it effectively and the reason when I talk about these the, the, the structural reasons why the fire took hold 
London is largely made out of timber. They're mainly timber framed houses, so they will burn. Um, the summer of that year had been very, very hot, so everything was very, very dry. And their means of construction, they, they had in the 15th and 16th centuries worked out how to build incredibly tall timber framed houses, which is to say they were able from the 15th century onward to build them up to four storeys, and some of them were even five storeys. And timber framed houses are built on projecting bays, which is to say that each floor you go up hangs over the street a little bit more and consequently if you had a narrow lane with very tall houses on then the tops of the houses would be very close together meaning that it would be very easy for the the flames to jump over. Um, also around the River Thames they were stored a lot of flammable materials so there was lots of uh, things like pitch also lots of alcohol there, there, there's still the the ward of Vintry which is uh, where the Walbrook uh, a small tributary of the Thames used to be, so there's lots of alcohol there, and all of this go goes up uh, very, very, yeah, burns very effectively. In warehouses there. Yes, in in warehouses and uh, people's shops and things. So one of the one of the interesting things that they did in Pudding Lane was that they the archaeologists uh, from the Museum of London investigated a site that was being redeveloped in the seventies, and they found in the um, cellar the the remains of a barrel of uh, of pitch in um uh, basically a, a sort of ordinary building, but it had in the basement a barrel of pitch. And one other thing that came from that site that's very interesting is one of my favourite exhibits in the the Museum of London it's just a piece of um, fused ceramic but the they can tell from the way the uh, molecule molecules settled after the uh, ceramic um, froze I suppose became solid again after the fire they can tell what temperature it reached and in putting lane the 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 fire reached a temperature of 1700 degrees centigrade and what's that in Fahrenheit uh, I'd have to do the calculation 3000 oh very good <laughs> All right, so we've heard how the Great Fire started, uh, but what means did they have to uh, deal and fight with this fire? Well, they had lots of things, and in particular the parish churches were required to keep fire fighting equipment so they kept uh, things called um, squirts which were like uh, big water pumps held by two men. Uh, they had um, shovels large shovels which they could use to um, put sand on fires. Um, they had buckets obviously and they had fire hooks and the fire hooks are probably the most important instrument. So this is a very long piece of wood and at the end of it is a, is a hoop of rope and also a hook. And the idea is that using the, the hook or the hoop of rope you could attach it to the uh, frames of these houses and pull them down and create fire breaks. In addition to this, they had various systems in place. So when the uh, fire gets going in, in London, what's supposed to happen is that people are supposed to f form chains uh, carrying buckets of water up uh, to, to the fire. So you'd have chains going uh, on both sides of the streets. One side, the buckets go up from the Thames. The other side, they go down again. Um, they had means, they also had means for dispersing water, though it's not clear if these had any effect. What was supposed to happen was that there's um, th they had a water wheel that had been in, uh, installed in the 1580s on the Thames and on a good day, i.e. when the, when the tide was right, they could uh, pump that water up as high as Cornhill which is one of the, the highest parts in the city of London and if there was a fire um, householders were supposed to turn the taps on and let the water run and it would just run down the hill and help put out a fire and also in the early 17th century there was the uh, New River Company and Hazel you used to do a very interesting walk on the, the New River is that one you can still offer to yeah, people? Yeah I still do it. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay good I enjoyed doing that one. So the householders were getting uh, water from the New River Company which brought in water from uh, Hertfordshire Via, via pipes and again they were supposed to open the taps and let the water out. I'm not quite sure what happened to the new river water and whether people actually did that during the fire. There's no, I haven't come across any reference to it so it may well be in the chaos that they didn't. Um, the, the water wheel unfortunately was very quickly consumed by fire so that, that would have been um, no good uh, at all. And then they also had various kind of um, uh, various 
things in place that wouldn't actually help with putting out the flames but were important if the fire was going on. So parish constables were supposed to stand at the end of the streets to prevent people uh, looting and one of the things that features pretty prominently in accounts of the fire is that the bells of the churches were supposed to be rung backwards uh, to alert people to the to, to the fast they could get away and, and ringing them backwards means that they were muffled um, and as I was saying earlier the crucial thing in all this firefighting the, the most effective thing was creating fire gaps and one of the accusations that's leveled against Thomas Bloodworth who was the Lord Mayor at the, at the time was that he was just not um, effective at creating fire gaps and famously the, they go to wake him up in, on, in, after the fire has been uh, identified and has got, it's got going and he turns to the people who have wake, woken him up and he says, pish, a woman could piss it out and then he turns over and goes back to bed and he's gone down in history for this remark um, and then later on when he does get up, when he is roused he's very reluctant to create fire breaks so Bloodworth thinks first of all the fire is going to be fairly trivial and to defend him a little bit that fits in with what I was saying earlier on about there not having been a huge huge fire since the early 13th century and then he gets a lot of stick because he's very reluctant to pull houses down but again in his defence somewhat it wasn't clear if he pulled down a house whether he would actually be personally liable for the expense of putting it back up again and also there was the simple fact that he was a Lord Mayor, he was a politician and he was to some extent answerable to the people whose houses he would be pulling down. Um, so they're a bit slow to get going with the fire breaks but what's interesting is that when they do create fire breaks they're not actually much good. Uh, when the fire finally progresses over to the west and gets towards uh, the River Fleet there are large hopes that the River Fleet will create a sufficient fire break of its own but it just doesn't happen that the flames leap over it and this brings me to the the main reason why this fire is so devastating in 1666 and why they haven't had one since the early uh, 13th century the real villain of the piece is the wind and the wind on that night is enormously strong there's there's a gale and uh, the gale is so strong that the English and Dutch fleets which are trying to engage each other in battle in the English Channel aren't able to do so and not only is the wind very, very strong, but it's blowing in the wrong direction from the point of view of London. It's coming from it's, it's blowing a southeasterly that night. And so the flames starting off in Pudding uh, Lane are fanned all over the, the rest of the city. And normally the wind would be blowing in the opposite direction. It would be a westerly, i.e. blowing from the west to the east. And the flames in that case would have been... Um, directed away from most of the city and possibly um, in a slight southerly direction onto the Thames itself, which would have been good. Uh, one little detail here, though, is that actually had the wind been going the other way, it would not necessarily have been a complete advantage to London because the Tower of London uh, is in that direction and the Tower of London was full of dynamite. And this was a, a great concern in the first couple of days of the fire, that the fire might encroach on the tower itself. So you mentioned about these human chains passing buckets of water up and down from the Thames. Uh, did they happen? I think they did, but not very much. So there's a, a, a limited reference to them in the in the sources. What's more clear from the sources is the complete panic and confusion. So Samuel Pepys, the diarist, goes for a walk on the uh, morning after the, the fire has begun, and he reports on the... Uh, increasing devastation in the area around London Bridge and one thing that he describes is people desperate to get their belongings away from the fire and taking them to the river with the hope of being able to throw them onto ferries or boats and the problem being one of the problems was that there weren't sufficient boats or ferries and people just throwing their belongings into the river so I think that what happened fairly quickly was that everything descended almost into into chaos. And what was the damage on both uh, City of London level, but also on personal level for Londoners? Geographically, it's absolutely devastating. The fire burns for four days and at the end of it, four fifths of the City of London is destroyed. And because of what I was talking about earlier about the wind, the only bit of the city that isn't destroyed is the uh, northeasterly part of it. And you can see this today because if you walk around the northeasterly part you can see some of the surviving 
pre-fire churches like St Helen's Bishopsgate, uh, St Catherine Cree Church, whereas in the rest of the city there is uh, nothing from before 1666. This created huge homelessness. The population of the City of London was about 80,000 and about 70,000 people were made homeless and perhaps this was the biggest immediate impact of the fire and these people had to go somewhere and they lived as refugees and a lot of them ended up as refugees in encampments uh, in the fields in and around the city. So Lincoln's Inn Field was one of them Moorgate was, an, Moorgate was another one. What is extraordinary, though, is that the number of casualties for this devastating fire, the official death count was about nine. And I think you and I, Hazel, have disagreed on this, this before, because you, I think you're a bit more sceptical about this figure, and you think that uh, the actual death toll might have been much higher. My hunch is, is that it wasn't. Um, the, the, the figure of nine comes from um, bills of mortality, people reporting deaths uh, to the authorities and it is therefore quite possible that uh, people who were underneath the radar would not get reported people like prostitutes uh, vagrants but against that is the fact that when they were uh, clearing the rubble um, we've got accounts of them coming across bodies and normally when they do that they're able to say ah oh, yeah that was so and so we told him to get out and he, he didn't he remained behind I don't think we can come to a definitive answer on this one, but we can, uh, that is to say about the accuracy of this figure, but we can say that the number of deaths were low. And it is interesting to speculate that building being a very dangerous occupation in the 17th century, probably more people were killed in the rebuilding of London than were killed in the fire itself. And what is certainly the case is that what we've talked about, the these refugees uh, camped out in the uh, fields in and around London, um, that the death rate amongst them must have been much, much higher than the, the nine who actually perished in, in the fire. The physical damage to the city included, of course, the city churches. So uh, 87 churches were destroyed out of a total of uh, 107. So an enormous... Uh, enormous quantity of um, churches destroyed and I think it's interesting re reflecting on this figure because it just shows how many churches there were in medieval London you couldn't walk very far and um, indeed as you walk around the city of London you can see where all the old cities were or sorry where all the old churches were because they're commemorated in in plaques normally and and some of them were extremely close indeed and it's interesting trying to imagine what the physical look of the city would be and also the the, the sound with all those, those church bells but nevertheless 87 of these churches are destroyed and of course when they rebuild them, this is the great opportunity for uh, Wren to rebuild the, the city churches in London. And when they rebuild them, they decide to uh, rebuild 51 of them. And uh, Wren is in charge of this project and it gives him, obviously, the scope to carry out this uh, very famous uh, rebuilding of London's parish churches. And talking of Wren, the obvious huge loss to London is this great cathedral in its midst, midst uh, medieval St Paul's and medieval St Paul's although one aspect of how fantastic a building it was was just to say how high it was I think it was from memory 560 feet high that the spire admittedly the spire disappeared in the 16th century but it was enormously high and I think again I'm just doing this recollecting that no building in London was higher was built higher than the medieval spire of St Paul's until the 1960s. Thanks very much for that, Ian. It's uh, really interesting. Oh, my pleasure. So I have done your Great Fire of London walk, but there's still plenty to learn. And I know that we could have covered uh, yet another 20 minutes talking about how the Great Fire of London then shaped the, the face of the new city of London. But uh, maybe people can come on your tour or we'll do it for a podcast another time. OK, good. That's all we've got time for now, but don't forget we have related blog posts um, to this episode on our episode uh, webpage, which is on londonguidedwalks.co.uk forward slash podcast. Check out our Daily London, giving you daily inspiration for things to do in London and for Londoners and visitors alike. And also Summer 2020, our summer promotion for private tours, 20% off, is now live. Hope to see you soon. Mm -hmm.